And the reason it's interesting is we use computers for so many things these days. And we've basically worked hard to create this abstraction of giving you a virtual machine that's sort of independent of time. Right? You're, you don't know whether, you know, occasionally you have these blank spots in your memory. You're running along and then things, the world stops and then I'll, you start running again. And unless you're continually asking the, the kernel what time is it real time, you don't notice that, you know, many milliseconds have passed between one instruction and the next as we've time shared our way around. So this abstraction is very nice. Most programs could care less about the actual elapsed real time. But some programs do, real-time programs do. So here you are, you're working for Ford, and you've designed the microprocessor is controlling the car, and it's controlling the carburation. You know, it's running the bejeweled game for the kids in the back seat. Okay. And it's also in charge of detecting, you know, sudden changes in the, you know, the accelerometer, which would indicate that you've just run into a bridge abutment, and deploying the airbag. Okay. Now, as it turns out, you have some number of milliseconds to deploy the airbag. It's not like it has to happen instantly. I mean, crashes are actually slow in terms of beta instruction times. Okay. But they're not so slow that you can let the kid you know, finish his wow round <laughs> or his, his, wow, his round of bejewel before deploying the airbag. So we have this notion of having to deal with real time. And what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the, the, some modest changes to our technology that will let us deal with real-time issues. But if people appreciate this, you're going to use the computer to control things that are happening in real time. Our little virtual time sharing system is a neat idea in the abstract, but practically it runs into issues that you might be running the email program just when you need to be putting the graphite rods into the nuclear reactor, which wouldn't be such a, you know, you don't want to wait until that time sharing quantum is up and you, know, you get around to scheduling the nuclear reactor control program. So, so we can either design a whole bunch of machines, each with a special purpose, that you know, are never doing any other task but the real time task. But instead, what we're going to do is modify how we do our processing, how we choose what to run in the machine, so we can multiplex it and do the real time things when they need to be done. Okay. So let me introduce some terminology here. We have this notion of a request. Typically, this is an interrupt uh, coming from some people. You know, the accelerometer, you know, the wrench encounter, uh, you know, buried in the nuclear core, whatever it is, uh, or the keyboard request from the back seat saying, you know, please drop the yellow ball here. Um, but all of these things are coming in. Uh, they will cause the kernel to eventually run some sort of handler uh, when it's processing the interrupt. And there may, in fact, be some sort of, and the amount of time between the request and when the handler starts is called the latency. And there may, in fact, be some sort of real-time deadline. If you don't deploy the airbag within 10 milliseconds of when the accelerometer says, oh my god, okay, you know, it's, don't bother deploying it because it's too late. So. <laughs> Um, so there's a notion of a real-time deadline. So this is sort of the abstract model of the process uh, of the, a whole bunch of things we need to deal with. So there's a bunch of requests, there's a, of, there's a service time, and there's a deadline. And what we're worried about is the latency. Really. We don't want the latency to get so long that we don't finish servicing the handler, we're running the handler and servicing the interrupt before we get, we want to do that before that we get to the deadline. So that's the technical problem we're trying to solve. And I'm going to spend 23 minutes describing that. Okay. All right. So first of all, let's talk about sources of interrupt latency. What would prevent you from actually just running the interrupt handler right away? Well, you know some reasons why we wouldn't run an interrupt handler right away. Why wouldn't we run an interrupt handler right away? IRQ goes high. Bingo. Next instruction is from the kernel, except when we're in the kernel. Right? So, so for us, um, we're, we're in the kernel. And what, what's taking time in the kernel? Well, we have to save the state and do context switches, right? So that takes, you know, it takes a certain number of instructions. Even if we were in user mode, it's going to be a certain amount of time, you know, measured in, in tens or perhaps hundreds of instructions before we actually get to the first instruction of, of the service routine for that interrupt. Um, we may, in fact, create instructions that run for a very long time. You know, uh, you, some architectures have block move instructions. Move everything, you know, move this megabyte from here to there. Well, they may take many, 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 many cycles. They're a single instruction, but they may have a very long running time. 
So we might want to, if we want good interrupt latency, we might want to avoid such instructions, or at least make them interruptible in our, in our hardware. Um, and then we have to worry about um, these long disabled times uh, because uh, we're in the kernel, or as we'll see when we start implementing uh, atomic operations uh, using semaphores, we, we have these problems. So we have to be, there's a lot of things we need to think about in order to make sure that the latency does not get too long for us to meet the deadlines appropriately. Okay, so we're going to spend some time, you know, we're, you know some things like opti optimizing how many registers get saved and, and things like that. Um, we will certainly try to avoid instructions that have arbitrarily long run times, uh, so forth and so on. Okay, and we're going to have to find a way perhaps to interrupt the kernel, and we, that's really what I want to spend some time sort of getting to uh, before the end of the lecture. So we do have this notion now of an interrupt, enable, disable bit, uh, which is in our case kernel mode bit. Um, and what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we've already talked about the interrupt process. And what we want to be a little concerned about is how to choose what to do when we finally take the interrupt. And I want to sort of talk about that next. So let me just put up a little sort of scenario. So we have these three devices, keyboard, disk, and printer, and they each have service times okay, um, associated with, with um, uh, how long it takes to, how much code needs to run in order to process the interrupt from each of these three devices. So one question we can ask is, you know, what's the worst case latency? And if we make no assumptions about what runs when, we sort of have to assume that if they all three interrupt at the same time, so we have this request, that's what this up arrow, but we have this request, and DPK means that we have three requests, all of which happened at the same moment. From the keyboard's point of view, either, both the disk and the printer may actually run beforehand, and so I have to add up their, their two service times, 500 and 400, before I'm going to start the execution of the kernel, of the keyboard interrupt handler. Right, so the actual latency before the keyboard thing run may be up to 900 as we take care of the disk and the printer interrupt. Um, and we're, at the moment, I'm making the simplifying assumption that you know, we're only going to get one interrupt, and I'm worried about now the worst case thing that can happen when they all occur together, and the order of execution of the handlers is sort of worst case for each device. So for the disk, it might have to wait for the keyboard and the printer, and you notice the disk has a very long latency because of the stupid keyboard routine. So I guess translating from Urdu or something is just hard. Um, the Urdu keyboard is complicated. Um, and the printer may in fact see a, a delay corresponding to the sum of the keyboard and disk handlers. Okay, so we can sort of say, well, this is not so good here. I mean, the latencies are sort of determined by the worst case that can happen with everybody else. And in particular, if we want something like the disk to be serviced quickly, how can we fix this? You know, we, we have some notion here of perhaps we need to come up with a mechanism for, for doing the important things first.